Welcome to a Rice University digital media production. For more information about us, please visit our website at www.rice.edu. I actually didn't do completely all of the programming. A friend helped me in the last six weeks of development, but yeah, basically. Ants are a part of the most disciplined, dedicated social system on Earth. Until that is, they become slaves to behavior controlling parasites. Suddenly, these rogue ants no longer serve the colony. They're taking their orders from the parasite. Okay, let's back up. Now, how did this happen? It all begins when the ants in any town USA consume the slime of a passing snail. They divide it up and take it back to the colony. This is a blunder of epic proportions. Turns out the slime is loaded with eggs of a body snatcher called the liver fluke, a type of flatworm. The liver fluke burrows into a part of the ant's brain, and for unknown reasons, it's almost like the fluke enslaves the ants and orders them to carry it to their next hosts. Any grazing mammal host with a nice warm liver will do, but in this case, a cow appears. The liver fluke worms can switch the ant's behavior on and off causing the infected ants to place themselves in easy to eat positions at dusk when mammals are feeding. No cows in sight, ants act normal. Cows appear, ants are in essence ordered to take their positions in purple flowers and latch on. The cows ingest the vegetation, the ants, and the fluke larvae inside the ants all in one bite. Once inside the cow, the worms burrow out of the stomach and into the liver where they develop into adults and dine on liver tissue. They lay eggs that are excreted from the liver into the bile duct and then defecated by the cows. They don't kill the cows, but the cows become weak and emaciated, devastating herds. And all because of parasitic mind control. You can think about that for a second while I swap monitors. Okay. So, um, I have the good fortune to be both a game designer and a programmer, right? And that's pretty cool, because what I do from day to day in my working life is I decide what to do and then I just like type it in and make it work somehow on a computer, right? This is different from what a lot of people in games do, where they have to like get an idea and get permission to implement that idea or else, you know, they have to do someone else's idea that they think is kind of stupid, right? Um, because of this, I have a lot of freedom in terms of what I work on and what I've been doing uh, for the past several years at least, is figuring out ways to make games that I think are you know, deeper than current video games or more meaningful than a lot of video games. But uh, those kind of phrases like deeper uh, tend to set people on edge. They're like, oh, what's wrong with current video games? You're saying current video games aren't good. They're not deep. And uh, so there's a phrase that I've sort of learned to adopt a little bit that helps uh, discussions proceed without being argumentative, right? And it's this phrase, speaking to the human condition, right? This is a, a traditional thing that we say about art, right? When people talk about the good parts of films and novels and uh, paintings and music and sculpture, and they talk about how these things can affect people deeply or change their lives or reveal truths to them, we'll say that these works speak to the human condition. Um, but the magic of this phrase is that it's pretty vague, right? Nobody will agree or even nobody knows exactly what it means. 
Um, but that's actually part of what allows us to employ it usefully, right, to have discussions. Uh, it's, it's a little bit, uh, a little bit of a paradox there. Um, but I and many other game designers uh, who are sort of in my school of thought, not my school of thought, but in a common school of thought, uh, you know, we feel like games so far don't do a very good job of speaking to the human condition, whatever that means for each individual person, uh, each individual designer. And so we're working on that. You know, we feel like games uh, currently tend to be temporary diversions, right? Uh, something I do for a little bit, but I don't really care about. Uh, in the same level of magnitude as the things that are truly important in my life, right? And so the operative question for me is, can that ever be changed? Can games become a medium deeply important to people? You know, deeply important to more people than like a professional StarCraft player or something like that. Um, so let me set some context uh, for this discussion. I'm going to talk about a couple of really old games from the 1980s. Uh, this first game is Pac-Man. I think even today everybody knows this game. Right, uh, it's, it's an arcade game. Uh, it's very simple. You run around this maze and you collect dots and you try not to get killed by the ghosts except sometimes you can turn around and eat the ghosts. Um, it's a fun game, you know, even today it's, it's uh, kind of fun to play. It had good game feel for the time which is just the way the controls feel and the way the sound effects sync with the graphics and stuff. Um, but, you know, nobody, most people I know would not say that Pac-Man really speaks to the human condition, right? This is not going to be a game that like you go, oh, it changed my life, right? It was really meaningful to me. No, it's a fun game, right? But it's just about running around a maze eating dots, right? Simple, simple game. Here's another game. Most people probably don't know what this is. Does anyone know what this game is without reading the caption? No. Uh, it's a game called Impossible Mission. It first platform it was released for was a Commodore 64, and it's a James Bond kind of game where you're infiltrating a evil genius's underground fortress to like stop a nuclear launch or something like that. Um, this was pretty much the halo of 1984 or something like that. Um, in addition to being very ugly, though, by modern standards, uh, it's, always, it's, it's also kind of unplayable by modern standards. Um, you kind of take these elevators around and you're trying to reach these obstacles on the level so you can like search them and find things. And you're trying to jump over these robots that shoot lightning out. And so it's all this like pixel perfect jumping and not falling into the gap and things like that. Um, you know, which video games of today still use once in a while, but it's this game is like 100% pixel perfect jumping and you get fried and you have to restart at the save point and do all this hard stuff over again. It's all these things that since then us video game designers have learned not to do because when you make things really difficult, when you throw a bunch of challenge at the player but they can see that the thing you're challenging them with is relatively meaningless like jumping over these stupid robots, then they tend to just stop caring about it very quickly, right? Now, the reason people loved this game back then is because this was new. Like, wow, I'd never played a game where I, you know, can pretend I'm James Bond and infiltrate this mountain fortress. But now we've played so many, I would say, better video games that uh, nobody wants to go back and play this, right? So in the uh, couple of decades since then, Game designers as a community have learned some best practices to help them make games that are either more playable and more enjoyable by a wider audience than something like Impossible Mission, or uh, things that are larger and more intricate and deeper than Pac-Man, right? Um, and if I were to write out the full list of what game designers have figured out, it would be many, many pages. I mean, I could probably write books on it. Uh, not that I would ever want to, but... Um, I've sort of picked four of the major things that all of you guys are going to recognize assuming you've ever played a video game, right? The first thing that we learn to do is put story in a game in a very concrete, progressing way, right? The story of Impossible Mission is like, hey, you're a secret agent and you're trying to infiltrate this forest, this fortress, but that story doesn't progress. There's no plot points or anything. It's just you're trying to do this and then you eventually solve enough puzzles and win the game. Um, humans like to hear stories. They uh, you know, stories have a magnetism. We want to know what happens next. And what game designers have learned to do is take that desire to find out what happens next and, and help use it kind of as a rope to pull you along through a video game. Um, now, in addition to pulling you through the game, it has this secondary uh, function, which is to justify what you're doing with a fictional excuse. If you play uh, old school 
first-person shooters like Doom or games like that, uh, really literally at the dawn of the first-person shooter, the way it would work is you're running around shooting a bunch of monsters and you're trying to get to the end of the level and you run into a door and it's a red door. And you know that to get to the red door, you need to find the red card key, right? And so you go find that and you go open the door and you keep going and eventually there's a blue door and you know you need to find the blue card key, right? And that was literally the way these games were paced for a while after that is just there's these relatively arbitrary game mechanical things preventing you from progressing. Now there's a green door, right? And you knew exactly what you had to do to get through the door, but there's no reason for it, right? Now we have games like, you know, Modern Warfare, where it's like, oh, we need to drive this tank to the next mission, but the tank's out of gas, and the guys are, like, infiltrating the fuel depot, so you need to, like, shoot a bunch of them and get in there and get some gas cans and bring it back to the tank and fill up the tank so our boys can drive on to the next mission. It's really the same thing as the red key and the red door, but now there's, like, this huge scaffolding around it to make it fictionally plausible and to try to make it engrossing, right? Um, another thing we've learned to do is add a bunch of eye candy and ear candy, like nice sound effects, to games because human beings like visual and oral stimulation, um, aural stimulation. Uh, and, it, you know, often the more of that the better, even if it's subtle, even if you're looking at a game that's uh, a... Uh, just a beautiful vista or something. It doesn't have to be explosions and bright fireworks going off everywhere. Although many games take that approach, right? The more of that that we have and the better synced it is to the sound effects, the more compelling the game ends up being. Um, the third thing is how we keep people playing, which is not only do they have a, a long-term goal that helps them make sense of what they're trying to do, but you break that up into little bite-sized goals. So it doesn't feel like I'm trying to do this epic thing that I don't ever know when I'm going to accomplish it because I have a nearer step, right? So maybe, um, I don't know, the, the tank mission isn't a very good one because first-person shooter missions aren't this long, but just imagine that it was an hour-long mission and getting the gas can was the half-hour point, but there was like a five-minute point of like, your first waypoint is to get up on the tower and scout out where the enemies are. Then you've got to go find the key, and then you've got to get open the warehouse, right? So you add these goals where the player always knows what they can do next, and it's a relatively easy thing. It feels well within their reach. And this keeps people playing. It's like, you know, just one more level, or if I just do this next thing, I'll be in a good spot so that when I save and go to bed and wake up tomorrow, you know, I'll be in a totally good position to keep going. And then, of course, they do that one thing, and then there's just one more next thing just within their reach now. And so they keep going and going, and you pull them through the game that way. And uh, so the last thing I want to highlight here is this feeling of constant improvement that we've added to games, which comes in many guises. Probably the most familiar one is in role-playing games, where your character has experience points, and you get enough of those, and his stats goes up, right? But that's actually... Uh, you know, a more uh, Byzantine version of just the score that we used to have in arcade games, right? Um, score provided a feeling of constant improvement because you could play again to get a better score and usually that would work. But now instead of having it be a player skill thing, it's what we call an avatar skill thing, which means it's more of a fictional thing in the game. So you're not improving your own skills, you're improving the fictional skills of something in the game world. You're learning new spells, you know, you're getting more gold pieces, you're getting awesome magic items that like glow with fire lots of eye candy when you run around with them, right? So hopefully all of that makes sense to everybody and there's no surprises there. Um, now, to segue into the next part of the talk, I think it's important to say that this kind of collection and hoarding mechanism, which we see in RPGs originally, but it's starting to spread into a lot of different game types, especially casual games, um, is the way those rewards are scheduled. Uh, we tend to do it with things if they're not exactly a Skinner box, they very closely resemble a Skinner box. And in case you don't know what a Skinner box is, it's something like this. It's an experimental setup where you have a mouse living in a box and he can't get out. And every once in a while, some kind of stimulus plays, like a light goes off or a sound happens or whatever. And during those uh, periods, if the mouse hits a lever, then a food pellet will come out, which uh, whether it's delicious or whether he's just really hungry, I don't know. Um, but then he learns that, right? And it's a way of training the mouse to perform this activity of hitting the lever uh, when a stimulus occurs. And the interesting thing about uh, Skinner boxes is if you give somebody a predictable reward, um, then the behavior is less well-trained than if you give them a randomized reward, right? So if every time the light goes on and the mouse hits the pellet once 
and, or hits the lever once and the food pellet comes out, you know, that kind of works. You can train the mouse to hit the lever, but if he has to hit the lever an unknown amount of times, like a random number between 1 and 10, you're going to really train that mouse to compulsively press this lever when, it, when a stimulus happens, right? Um, and probably most of you, oh, and in, in case you want to like shock the mouse or something, there's like an electric floor. Um, I guess that's if you're really pissed off that he's not learning to press the lever. I, you can do a bunch of different experiments with this kind of setup. Um, anyway, you're probably more familiar uh, with Skinner boxes in this kind of context where they don't have electric shock floors. Um, but uh, a slot machine is almost exactly a Skinner box in that it has a randomized reward schedule that's optimized to get you to put as many coins as possible into the slot machine. Um, or you might be uh, more familiar with them in this context, uh, which is a dungeon crawler type of RPG, where every time you open a, you know, a barrel or a crate, there's an unknown quantity of treasure inside. It might be completely empty. It might just have a couple of gold pieces, and you're like, ah, but it might have like 10 gold pieces, and you're like, oh, awesome. You know, I'm, I'm really on my way to buying that next level of sword. So anyway, uh, this game design best practices set here is going to be so useful to refer back to that I'm going to put it in a toolbox so I can carry it with us through the rest of the talk. But just remember what this stands for. This is all the good stuff that game designers have learned to do to make games compelling to play and more appealing to more people than the old style games used to be. So how did we arrive? How, how do we know these are best practices, right? How did we learn these? There are two ways. And one of the ways is very uh, natural. And it's just this process of evolving inspiration that happens in the game designer community. Most people who want to design games are doing it because they like video games, right? So they have some particular game that they really liked a lot, and they're like, oh, that game was cool, but you know what? It would be even cooler like, if the gun was bigger or something, right? I mean, that's not a very, uh, you know, uh, actually a real one is it would be really cool if you not only shot people, but you could shoot people with a gun, and you would like stake them to the wall so they're hanging on the wall afterward, right? Does anyone know that game? Yes. I don't know. Did someone say something else? It was Painkiller did it originally. Maybe somebody did it before Painkiller, but I don't know what game it is if they did that. Um, so there's this process of taking something you thought was cool or interesting or neat and making it better, right? Um, and, and that's a very, uh, I'm going to say, innocent kind of motivation, right? It's a joyful kind of thing to take something that was there done by your predecessors and kind of stand on the shoulders of giants and, and make something even better. Um, but over time, as game budgets got bigger and we became more professional, uh, I put that in quotes because it's a word I really don't trust, um, we learned how to monitor players in a little bit of a better way. Because what was happening in the earlier days, even into the 90s, is we'd think that our game was great, you know, we did a really good job polishing it, uh, you know, uh, it's better, clearly better than the previous game, and then you sit someone down and, and they try to play it and it's like totally unplayable. They can't get used to the controls that we got really good at because we're the developers and we've been using the controls for like years. Um, they don't understand where they're supposed to go and what they're supposed to be doing when we thought we made all that stuff clear. So uh, the method that we've come up with for dealing with this um, is to just silently watch players, right? You sit them down, they start playing your game and usually they're gonna start to have problems. And typically the way that you deal with that uh, or, the, or the instinct for dealing with that is to help them out, like, no, no, oh, sorry, you know, we didn't make the HUD for this clear enough, you know, do this thing or press this button. But you don't do any of that. You don't help them at all. You just sit there and watch them, right? And it's very painful to sit there and watch them, but you do it, and, um, and uh, every time there's a, there's a little glitch or, uh, you know, they, they get confused, you write it down. And that gives you your to-do list for when you go and work on your game later, right? Um, this is a sort of a... I will say a little more scientific way of designing games than, uh, than the first way, than, than just what I think would be cool, right? Because it involves empirical observation and then responding to those observations. I have to find where I am in my notes because I haven't been using them. All right. Okay, so imagine I've done all this and I'm making some modern game and it's a dungeon crawler game and uh, it employs a bunch of those things from that best practices toolbox, right? So it's got a 
treadmill of player stats that just go up and up and up, and equipment stats. You can get better and better swords and armor, and all many different categories of equipment, right? And the equipment prices go up, and maybe you need gems for some of them, and maybe you need gems to like instill capabilities in different weapons, and then you kind of want to reclaim those gems, right? So there's kind of an intricate ecology of these improving stats on many different kinds of uh, objects in the game, right? Then, uh, like I said, we'll have a loot skinner box where you kill a monster and a random reward pops out of the monster, or you open a chest and a random reward pops out. We have all these cool explosion effects and weapon trails and like, you know, lightning strikes and stuff like that. And uh, we have all these little five minute quest milestones, so you always have a very tangible next thing to do. And we have this epic story about how there's this evil guy, the Foozle, who you have to go kill in the end, and you're the only person who can do it, right? Um, so we do all those things. And we have a very compelling game. We know that. We can almost manufacture these off an assembly line now. Um, but now do a certain thought experiment where you take that big list of things that I just said and take the same game but strip all those items out of that game, right? So no big story about the foozle, right? And no five minute quest milestones. They can be functionally there but just don't, uh, don't put them in, in in a player leading kind of way, right? You take out the loot skinner box and uh, replace it with typical game balance. You take out all the non-necessary uh, special effects. Um, you make it something like chess, right? So chess is an abstract game. It doesn't particularly have eye candy or special effects. It certainly doesn't have an epic story. But it's considered to be a very compelling game, right? There's a core of chess that doesn't need anything from that toolbox that has fascinated people for many, many years. Right? So imagine the dungeon crawl version of chess, right? What would that game be? Um, and I don't mean game mechanically, right? I mean, I mean stripped down. Um, here's, here's a graph. Uh, so, um, you know, in these games, you know, I mentioned the word treadmill a couple slides ago. The way these are very intentionally designed is we want the player to feel more and more powerful and like he's... Uh, you know, having progress, so he gets experience points and he gets better equipment and all that. But, you know, if, if the monsters didn't get harder too, then the game would become trivial easy after like 15 minutes because we really pump stats through the ceiling, right? So what you do is you have them encounter harder and harder monsters over time, and the two go up roughly uh, in parity, right? So what happens is if you graph the difficulty of the game over time, it's probably something like this, assuming the designer was reasonably skilled, where it starts out kind of easy, and then it ramps up after a sort of tutorial phase, and then it kind of oscillates for a bit. <clears throat> this line, this dotted line across the middle, is sort of what we think of as the difficulty of the game on average. And note that we actually don't make the difficulty lock to that line and go horizontally. And the reason is because that doesn't feel that good. You know, instead, we set up a bit of an oscillation around this, so you have periods of intensity and then periods of relaxation and periods of intensity and periods of relaxation. This provides for a sense of drama in the gameplay um, as well as uh, actually allowing the player to feel powerful, right? Because if, you, if, you, if monsters are always perfectly matched to you, you never get to feel like this awesome sword that you got or, or the fact that you're level 17 matters, right? But if you feel more powerful for a little bit and then that gradually wears away, people won't notice. So in some sense, this curve is about creating drama and in some sense, it's about fooling the player into feeling like the treadmill is more real than it is. Anyway, um, so while you're doing all this stripping down of this game, you might as well downgrade the graphics because that's all eye candy, right? It's not really necessary. So you probably get something that looks like an indie game, uh, but it's all functional. You know, you can make the same game out of all that. Um, so after you've done this, uh, go take a poll, right? Uh, you know, game companies love to ask people what they want. Um, you go take a poll of how many people want to play this game versus how many people want to play the awesome looking AAA game that you started with. And what you find is very few people want to play this stripped down game. Um, you know, some people might, very, very hardcore gamers might do it, but you, you lose most of your audience, right? Um, That's all I'm going to say about that at the moment. Um, now, this is uh, RPGs are 
a very complicated genre of game, right? Like I said, they have all these like intertwining things that we've learned how to weave together to create player motivation. So you can run this exercise again with a much simpler thing, and, and this might help convince you that what I'm saying makes sense, or it, it might help make the model make more sense, right? So think about slot machines again. Um, imagine doing the same stripping down process to a slot machine. Um, right? So you get rid of all the flashing lights and ringing bells and sounds and stuff. And uh, you, know, you also get rid of the Skinner box, right? So you get rid of that reward schedule I was talking about. So you don't actually ever win any money from this slot machine. And, and just to make it fair, you don't put any coins in either. And it's actually better because now you don't lose money ever, whereas with a real slot machine, you're guaranteed to lose money over time. So this is a 100% improvement over the traditional slot machine functionally, right? So all that happens now uh, we've gotten rid of all these things, so it's a relatively plain looking box with still the dials in there with different shapes on it, and you pull the lever and the shapes spin, and either they match and the slot machine says, hey, you won, or they don't match and the slot machine says, oh, you didn't win, right? But whether you win or didn't win, you don't win anything, and uh, you don't lose anything. So how many people would play that slot machine, right? You might play with it for a second as a novelty, but it's not something that people are gonna be mobbing into casinos to play, right? And more to the point, it's not going to be something that you know, state and national governments be th feel threatened enough by socially that they have to regulate it or outlaw it, right? Because it's, it's become, by the time you take away the reward schedule, it's become a totally different device, even though mechanically it's the same device, right? So all those designer best practices that I was talking about um, can take something that's inherently boring and pointless like a box where you pull a lever and don't really win anything, right? And turn it into something that's compulsive, right? Compelling. And the thing is we can do this with video games as well, and you know, not just slot machines, right? Um, in a sense, we figured out a way to engineer our way around boredom, right? And take a relatively pointless game that's just about like clicking on things and, and not doing anything real and adding production values to it and turning it into something that a lot of people want to play, right? Um, and this is key, right? It's about we've engineered our way around boredom to a certain point. Um, and, and I'm focusing on boredom right now, but we've engineered our way around some other things. Like we've engineered our way around frustration by just learning how to tune games really well and doing that player watching stuff that we saw before. Every time someone gets frustrated, like, oh, I can't beat this monster, you just make that level easier, right? So you iron out all these bumps, and eventually you get a very smooth play experience that a lot of people want to participate in. And we keep doing this in video games, just keep better, getting better and better and more fun, and we all live happily ever after the end, right? Um, probably not. I certainly have issues with this, and I know other people who do as well. Um, I said that we're engineering our way around boredom. What does that mean, really? I mean, it's, there's a very obvious surface meaning to it, but wh like, what effect does that have? What does it really do? Um, and to answer that, you have to know, like, well, what is boredom, right? People don't like boredom. They don't like thinking about boredom. They don't like being bored. But boredom is actually a healthy response to unproductive situations, right? Human beings have boredom as a response because of evolution, right? Boredom has survival value. Um, what it's for is you get into a situation that's unproductive, right? Your senses aren't being stimulated. You're not learning anything about your new environment. You're just being surrounded by the same old stuff. And you get bored and you start getting jumpy and agitated and that causes you to want to go do something new or go do something different, right? Um, it, it causes you to go outside of your normal behavior patterns. So. Uh, Hopefully, a lot of us are computer scientists in here. So if you're familiar with the hill climbing process, what happens in hill climbing is you'll often start going up a hill, and then you get stuck at a, at a local maximum, right? And you can think of boredom for human beings to vastly oversimplify the situation as being something like adding a simulated annealing step into your hill climbing process to allow you to get unstuck. Right? You're in a place that's pretty good. You're not in any imminent danger or whatever, but you're bored. You start doing different stuff, and it jumps you around this graph to different places. And eventually, one of the places you jump may allow you to climb higher. Right? So here's, here's the point. Um, imagine that for some reason, we're playing that stripped down version of the RPG that has none of the graphics and none of the player stats or anything. Right? And in fact, uh, it's so stripped down that looking at this graph, like when you kill a monster, um, 
you know, normally in an RPG you get loot and maybe some items and some experience points, which are all different progression things. Those are really just different ways of bumping you slightly along this drama curve toward the end of the game. They just do it in a way such that they camouflage that that's what's happening. We'll just get rid of all that right stuff, right? Just every time you kill a monster, it just disappears without even a sound effect, because you know it disappeared. You don't see it anymore. And then you just slightly bump a pointer along this drama curve a little bit, right? So you do all that, and for some reason you found someone who's still playing this game. Um, <laughs> um, to use as sort of an example case for another thought experiment, right? Um, and, then, and then you reverse that process and you add in all the production values uh, to create something that's compelling, right? So it's not just the fact that we've engineered our way around boredom, but we've taken this evolutionary mechanism that was a defense for human beings, right? That was a way, a thing that they use to uh, increase their survival value, to improve their quality of life, and we're redirecting it, right? So instead of improving the things about their own quality of life, they're now improving, improving imaginary things in an imaginary world, right? But they're still exerting you know, time and effort, right? It's just the effort is going somewhere different now. Um, now, in the process of going somewhere different, what happens to it? Well, a lot of it just is in this imaginary world, but some of it goes into the game designers and game publishers' wallet, right, in the form of, you know, whatever, maybe a micropayment, maybe the price of the game, and, and whatnot, right? So if you think that about this objectively, right, engineering your way through a human defense and then profiting by that is a parasitic form of behavior. Um, but, you know, I'm, I'm a game designer, right? And I don't necessarily want to think of myself as a parasite. Uh, and, and a lot of game designers, if you were to say this to them, they would say, well, hey, you know, uh, we're not parasites because people genuinely enjoy our games. And they pay us for what we do, you know, voluntarily. Um, but, you know, maybe those ants, uh, the subjects of parasitic mind control at the beginning of the video, um, you know, maybe they're really enjoying themselves while they hang from that purple flower and get eaten, right? Uh, the fact of whether they're enjoying themselves or not is almost immaterial to whether something devious is going on. Um, uh, but taking a measured view toward this, right, and not just trying to flog it for controversy, I do find that, you know, even if you believe this argument that what we're doing is circumventing human defenses, uh, it's not necessarily a bad thing, right? We circumvent human defenses for good purposes all the time, right? So say, uh, for whatever reason, your liver's failing and you need to get a transplant, um, you go to the doctor, he'll operate on you, you know, and, and what does he do? Well, he circumvents his way through your pain defense, right, by giving you some anesthetics. He cuts you open with a scalpel, he jiggers around in there, right, and then hopefully you're better at the end of that process and you give him some money, right, and he takes that money and puts it in his wallet. Um, but you can think of a parallel situation, or a parallel in many ways, where you're just in a bar and you're trying to get home at night, and uh, there's a mugger there, and at first he gets around your social defenses, maybe just by hiding or by appearing to be in, uh, unthreatening until you get close, and then he gets through your physical defenses, you know, and he cuts you open with a knife and takes some money of yours and puts it in his wallet, right? Um, they're very similar situations. Uh, but the, the ultimate difference really is, is whether this process of circumventing the defenses and getting the money in response was, a benefit, was of benefit to the person being circumvented or, or was harmful to the person being circumvented, right? Um, now you might also, uh, my first thought when I was thinking about this was, well, maybe it doesn't really have to do with benefit and harm. Maybe it's just about whether it's voluntary or not, right? Like you hopefully voluntarily went to the doctor and you hopefully didn't voluntarily get mugged. Um, but we can do another thought experiment uh, to prove that that's not the case, right? So imagine there's some confidence man. You don't know he's a confidence man. You just meet him out on the street, and he's like, oh, you know, I, my wife's sick, and I've got to go get on a plane, uh, you know, to, to go take care of her, but I lost my wallet, and it had my, my plane ticket and, and all my credit cards in it, um, but I need money to go see her right now, and, and uh, you know, and I've got this really nice watch, right? It's a gold watch, surely at a pawn shop, uh, you could get $200 for it. So why don't you give me $100 right now and then I can go get on the plane and, and you'll make a profit and everybody's happy. And he's very convincing. He has a great personality, so you believe him. 
Uh, you give him $100, he gives you the watch, and five minutes later, you're down the street at the pawn shop. Uh, by the way, he's jumped in a cab, and he's gone ostensibly to the airport. And at the pawn shop, you find out the watch is fake, right? And you got ripped off. Um, but you voluntarily entered into that business transaction, right? But it's still a crime, right? It's still fraud. He still did something uh, that was a crime, right? So let's, uh, let's extend this thought experiment. Let's think of another confidence man. Um, he's a little better than the earlier guy, right? And he plays for higher stakes. Uh, he, he works on Wall Street, and he offers to invest your money uh, for five years and give you great returns at the end of that five years. And you're like, sounds great. I've got this money in the bank. Didn't know what to do with it. Now I know. So you give him $100,000, and you know, he goes, gets in a cab and goes away. And unbeknownst to you, he gets on a plane and flies to Thailand to live off your money for the rest of his life. But uh, he has an assistant who every month uh, for the five years mails you a statement with an imaginary number in it that's getting higher and higher, showing that, yes, your money is creating profit, and you're going to be really happy at the end of these five years. And so you're happy over the, the intervening time. And of course, the five years expires, and the guy's nowhere to be seen, and you realize that all your money has been stolen, and then you're very unhappy at the end of that period, right? So now there's a crime, uh, but you didn't know it was a crime for a long time, um, but it's still pretty bad, right? $100,000, I, you know, I don't want that stolen. Um, so, but, but again, you voluntarily entered into that, and you didn't have a problem with it for a while, right? But it's, it's still a crime. So, uh, while I'm still in the midst of this whole foray here, just to, to remind of the point that I'm trying to make is that I'm saying that, at least in the context of game design, what I want to think about is benefit versus harm and not voluntary versus involuntary. So the third case, he's maybe the best confidence man of all, right? And he makes a deal with you. You enter into some kind of nebulous business arrangement with him. And uh, there's never anything clearly wrong. Um, He's just so good at taking things from you in a very, very subtle way that you never notice, just little droplets of money at a time, that you never figure out that anything's happened for five years, 10 years, 20 years, your whole life, right? You live to be 75, 85, 95, whatever's a good old age when you're old, right? Um, and you die happy. Uh, but the fact is that you actually die kind of poor, and you actually could have been much richer if this guy hadn't been stealing money from you for your whole life. But he was so good at it that you never even imagined that anything was wrong. You never imagined that you could have had more money and lived a more healthy, uh, fulfilled life with that money if you know how to spend money properly. Um, so it's not even the realization that you were wrong that makes it a crime, right? There's something about people mistreating people that makes something a crime or that makes it unethical or however you want to think about that. So, to start to lead into where that's going, the way I feel about games is there's a sort of a spectrum, right? There are many spectra, but the one I want to talk about has on the left here games that have some kind of core to them that are intrinsically meaningful, like chess. You can strip away all those designer best practices, and chess is still a very compelling, interesting game, right? And then all the way on the right side of the spectrum, are games where if you stripped away all that stuff, they're basically completely meaningless. Nobody in their right mind would really want to play them, right? Um, and obviously, there are lots of uh, points in between that games can occupy. Um, to pick another example, right, besides chess, uh, we'll go to Go, which is even more minimalistic than chess. It has even simpler rules. It uses absolutely none of the best practices from that toolbox, and yet many people will tell you it's the greatest game ever made, right? So obviously these best practices are not about making an inherently good game, right? They're about something else. They're, they're orthogonal to whether the game is good. They're about convincing people to pay attention to your game and want to play it, and about giving them feelings of compulsion regarding your game or not, right? And when I put things on the spectrum, I, I don't even think this is an absolute property of games, that some of them are inherently, uh, you know, that, that everybody should evaluate these games the same on the spectrum, right? Because part of a game's value to you is whether it brings you a new experience, whether it makes you think about something in a new way. And the first time you play a certain kind of game, it probably does bring you a new experience. So even something like Farmville 
is probably cool to play for like five or 10 minutes, right? Um, but, but for most people, most of the time, um, I would say that it lands about as far toward the right side of the spectrum as you can get, although you know, history keeps marching on and we'll see what game developers come up with you know, 10 years from now. Um, so so my, my, my point with the spectrum is uh, even, though, you know, even though everybody's different and everybody has different opinions about what's valuable in a game or what, what they liked about a game or what's cool about it, it still is possible to generally classify things and generally make judgments about things, not only as an audience but as a game designer. I can look at a spectrum and say, you know, I really want my work to be over here. I don't want my work to land over here, right? So just because people have different opinions doesn't make that impossible. Now, there's a reason I, I bring up Farmville, and it's because it's, it's really bugging me lately. Um, you know, a few years ago, I gave a talk about World of Warcraft and how I thought that was pretty much a bad idea. Uh, but Farmville is way worse, actually, not only because it has a bigger audience of more mainstream people, but because of the way it operates intentionally, the way Farmville is designed to operate is much more dastardly than the way World of Warcraft is designed to operate. And uh, to explain this, I'm going to uh, read a quote from Ian Bogost, who's a professor at Georgia Tech, and he made a game called Cow Clicker, which is a parody of uh, these kind of Farmville games, which, which we'll look at in a second. Um, but what, the way he explains it is, uh, you know, many of today's, he starts by talking about traditional single player console games, right? Many of today's console games exert a time crutch, crush. They demand tens or even hundreds of hours of attention to complete, some or most of which often feels empty. In that respect, one could argue that many games seem to destroy time. But social games do something even more violent. They also destroy the time we spend away from them through obligation, worry, and dread over missed opportunities. Now, if you haven't played these games, you might not know how they do it. Hopefully, some of you in this room have not played these games. This is Frontierville, which is a new version of Farmville that was launched recently. And um, just like a dungeon crawler RPG has a lot of different things woven into it to get you to, to behave in certain ways, um, so also does this game. And uh, it's insidious in a few different ways. It's got this, uh, you know, it's got this, that little energy bar up at the top with the lightning bolt. Um, that's how many moves you have, right? And you can spend all those moves probably in one or two minutes, but it's not enough to really accomplish everything you wanted to do when you sat down to work on your farm. So you've got to wait for the moves to refill, but they don't, uh, they don't refill very fast, right? It takes probably, you know, I don't know exactly how long, but it's probably three or four hours for that bar to fill all the way up, right? So you want to spend those moves before the bar fills up, but the problem is if you go to sleep or you go watch a movie or something like that, you're going to start wasting moves because the bar is going to fill up at, at 14 here in this picture and then you just won't get any more turns after that. So it's like you want to check in with Frontierville every three hours and spend your moves because otherwise your farm is just not getting as good as it would get otherwise, right? Um, the other thing it does that's pretty evil is that crops wither in this game, right? So you plant crops. The way it works is you buy a crop for a certain amount of money. You go plant it. You come back later and harvest it and you get more money. It's a very, uh, it's a very simple loop. Um, but the crop withers after a certain amount of time if you don't come harvest it, right? So that suddenly makes you very worried to come check in at the game, like, oh, you know, I was going to play tonight, uh, but I'm running late in traffic, so I'm going to whip out my, uh, you know, my iPhone and play Farmville on there so I can get my crops so they don't wither, right? These things are designed to make you worry about the game even when you're not playing the game. So uh, Cow Clicker. So I've got a screenshot here, is, uh, I only realized this today for some reason, but when I was talking about that strip down a game exercise, that's exactly what Cow Clicker is. It takes this genre of games and boils them down to the absolute essential. There's a cow, your cow that's in the middle of the screen, and you can click it. But instead of having a bunch of moves, you get one click. That's all you get, and then a six hour timer starts, and six hours later you get another click, right? Um, if you buy the in-game currency, uh, which is Mooney, right, then you can spend that to get other clicks faster, right? So then you can click on your cow. And then if you invite friends into your pasture, you can all earn Mooney, right? So it's got all this, uh, the same, you know, attempted virality that, that all of these games have. Um, and of course, uh, to amplify that virality, 
Uh, every once in a while, you know, you click the cow and it says, hey, you clicked your cow. Do you want to share the fact that you clicked your cow with your friends? And you do that and then it goes into your friend feed like that. Hey, I'm clicking a cow. <laughs> okay, it's, it's funny, but the reason that it's funny is because that's exactly what these games are. Right? So you play Frontierville and, well, this is an email uh, pestering, but it, it pesters you to sign up for emails. And then you're in there and like, oh, I'm going to clean up my garden, so I'm going to clobber this fox that's keeping me from doing anything. And then it's like, oh, you clobbered a fox. Nice going. Do you want to share that with your friends? Um, and it does this all the time. Like, if you haven't played this game, in the middle of those 14 moves, you probably get like three nag screens like this. Not an exaggeration. So you, you, you can barely even do what you're trying to do. Um, So anyway, that alone would be dangerous enough, right? The fact that game designers have now uh, maybe crossed some ethical line where they're explicitly designing games for you to be worried, right? Explicitly designing them to decrease the quality of your life when you're not playing them. Um, <laughs> that's, that's what they do. Um, oh, you know, OK, so I, I didn't finish making my point, which is just that uh, as not good of a game design as I think World of Warcraft is, it's at least made in some way that's more innocent than that, right? Like the guys who make World of Warcraft like running around killing monsters with swords and stuff, right? And they envision some kind of audience that is like them who would also like that kind of game. Um, and even though it's a giant endeavor that's you know, at some point no longer about pure joy when you're toiling to make a game, that's kind of what they're doing. They're making games for people who kind of like the same kind of thing that they do. Okay, at I don't want to single out Farmville and Frontierville, but at any of the companies who make these games in, in a high stakes kind of way, nobody there thinks this is a good game, right? They're not trying to make games for people to enjoy. They're simply trying to maximize uh, either the amount of money they get in from a user or the amount of virality they get from that user to contact other users or both. That's all they care about. Um, and that's obvious by looking at the game design, right? Uh, if they wanted Frontierville to be more fun, there's a bunch of things they could do. They could give you more moves. They could even move to a system where your number of moves isn't limited, so you can just kind of tend your farm however you want, right? Um, but that would make it less addictive, and their goal isn't enjoyability, it's, it's addictiveness, right? Um, they could nag you less. They could, like this, this screen pops up right in the middle of whatever you're doing. Like you're going to run over and grab a piece of pie and it's like, hey, share this with your friends, right? They could stop nagging you while you're in the middle of something and save the window for later. But they know that if they do that, you're like less in the moment and are less likely to uh, respond um, or, or to, uh, to assent to this kind of uh, virality. Okay, so that would be evil enough, right? Um, but we have new technology that makes it uh, even easier, right? In the old days, making video games was like, you work for a while on something, and you finish it, and then you deliver it to somebody's door. And you're like, here's my video game, do you like it? And a lot of the time they'd say no, but hopefully you sell enough of them, right? Um, now it's not like that, because now we have games on the internet. And games on the internet do this thing called A-B split testing to maximize profit. Web guys love this. Who, who knows what this is in the audience? OK, small percentage, so, so I'll explain it. Um, this is basically another kind of hill climbing algorithm, right? Where instead of delivering one product to everybody, you split your audience into, let's say, two random samples, right? Completely random. Um, you give half of them version A of the game and half of them version B of the game, right? Just like any scientist running a control in an experiment and then an experimental group. Um, and what kind of things might you change between version A and version B? Well, maybe it's like the background color, right? To see how that affects people's psychology. Maybe it's the style of the main character to see what kinds of characters people identify with. Maybe it's like, you know, how much gold do I get for punching a fox? Um, you know, and maybe it even varies by region. Maybe like Americans like the game more if you get this much gold for punching a fox, but Europeans like it more if they get this much gold for punching a fox. And actually I just said like it more, but that's not even what they measure. What they measure is how many new players get attached to the system and how much new money they get from you buying, you know, micropayment kind of things, right? That's what they're measuring with this A-B testing. And so what you do as you put out two versions, you see which one works better and you throw the other one away and then you start again. You put out two more versions and two more versions and you keep going down this like infinitely branching tree and you're constantly optimizing your game all the time. Now, A-B testing by itself is not that new of a thing. You know, if you're, 
if you work for a candy company in the 80s and you wanted to make a new candy bar, that's kind of an expensive endeavor to like ship that out to everybody in the USA. So what you do is you maybe make two versions of the candy bar and you put them in test markets, right? Like one of them is like Burlington, Vermont, and the other one is like, you know, uh, Fresno, California or something, right? And uh, you see how those do in, in various markets. And then if one of them is successful enough, you like start selling that nationally. You scale it up. Uh, that takes a long time to do. Compared to today, when you have web stuff, any company who has the user base the size of one of these uh, very popular games, like Farmville or whatever, can run a very meaningful A-B test in a day, or in six hours, or even in one hour. Right. So the iteration time isn't actually bounded by the time it takes to actually run the test now. It's more bounded by like, uh, you know, infrastructure issues of in the, at the company, like how, how quickly can they put the test together to make sure they're not breaking everybody's thing? How quickly can they decide even what they want to test, right? So remember back before that I was saying we used to design games just by doing what we thought was cool. Imagine that's a weapon like a bow and arrow or something. Uh, and then we got a little more scientific about it. Uh, and, uh, you know, we decided to watch people in, in, in a more empirical and observant way without trying to influence them, right? And imagine that's a weapon like a flintlock rifle. Uh, what you've got now on the web is something like this, uh, where it's just firing all the time, right? And that, um, at some point, the difference between this and this is not just a difference in quantity of projectiles, right? At some point, a quantitative difference becomes qualitative, right? At some point, you can just do totally different things with this new weapon than you could have done with the old weapon. Right? And what kind of things can you do? Well, uh, you know, maybe you're not firing actual bullets, but you're doing psychological experimenting things and profiting off them. So um, there's another interesting thing uh, that I think is interesting about game design, is that game design is kind of a game by itself. Right? I've made a bunch of puzzle games. And I found that like, looking at a situation and saying, how do I make an interesting puzzle out of this, is itself a really interesting puzzle, right? Um, so there's this huge irony going on um, that the companies that are making these social games that basically have no gameplay value in them right, are actually themselves playing a much more interesting game than the game that they're making for you to play, right? The game they're playing is this huge multi-dimensional optimization problem where you're like trying to gather data and make the best decision and all that, and the game they're making for you to play is like clicking on a cow a bunch of times and you get some gold, right? Um, so that's, you know, very, uh, very strangely humorous. Um, and as I visualize that happening, right, somebody at one of these companies, they're doing their A-B testing, they're kind of tweaking something for Europe and tweaking something for America and tweaking something for Canada, and then going over here and like, oh, this A-B test is done, let's look at the graphs of the results and let's write a report on that and stuff. Um, you know, it's a little bit like planting trees and rearranging a garden and like minding livestock and all that, right? So you could say that the people making Farmville are not only playing a game, but they're playing some kind of like er Farmville that is way more interesting, right? And so the sad fact of what this all comes to is you've got these people. You know, Farmville has a wide demographic. It's not just computer nerds who play it, apparently, anymore. Um, so you've got all these people who think that they're playing this cool game uh, you know, where they mind their cows and their pigs, and they're feeling like the boss, and they're getting all this gold, and they're getting richer, and their farm is looking nicer. There's all these ways that they feel like they're progressing. But what's actually happening is that someone is farming them. right? So uh, you know, there's all these imaginary farms out there. Uh, where, where you gain imaginary money, but then there's a real farm with real money that, that pulls, you know, it pulls money from you over the internet. Um, and you don't ever see it because that's all like behind your head while you're like typing into the computer. So uh, now I put all this up, you know, I, some of the analogy, the weapon analogy is a little heavy handed, but I honestly couldn't come up with anything better in the time available, uh, which was like one day. Um, but <laughs> Uh, but I actually don't think, like looking at this situation this way, like somebody is farming the players of Farmville, I, I don't think that this is hyperbole. I don't think it's any kind of distortion of reality, right? This is what is actually happening in San Jose or wherever their office is now, right now. Are they in? Are they in San Francisco? All over the Bay Area it's happening. There's tons of these companies. Anyway, so you talk to game designers about anything. I mean, any time that I question 
current paradigms in game design, because I go to a lot of game conferences and talk to these people, game designers have a defense, which is just like, look, man, we're just giving people what they want. They're, they want to play our game. They're having fun, right? Um, that is true. I cannot exactly argue with that. People report that they're having fun, and certainly they pay money to play the game. But the fact is that, as we know from areas of other areas of life, right, sometimes people want things that are not good, either not good for them or not good for people around them, right? Sometimes it's not good in a mild way, and sometimes it's not good in an extreme way, like they're ODing on heroin and they're barfing all over the floor all the time, right? Um, so as a game designer, you can make your own decision about whether you care that what they want is not good for them, right? Or about whether you want to exploit their susceptibility device and profit from it. Um, my personal gut feeling is that all this Farmville stuff is just evil. Um, it's not even mildly evil. It's like if you go and look at the discussions that happen day to day at those companies among the designers, they are very evil, right? They are about stuff like how do we get people thinking about our game all day every day, right? How do we get them to buy the maximum number of things that have the minimum amount of utility for them in their real life? Because if they get a lot of utility out of it, um, you know, it, they get satiated, right? It's like, it's like, this is totally off the cuff, right? But it's like Coca-Cola, right? Coca-Cola and, and soft drinks like that get marketed as refreshing, but the ingredients in them actually do not refresh you in any way. They actually make your body a little bit thirstier, right? So that you'll want to drink more. That's how soft drinks work. Um, and Farmville is, and all those games are like that. Um, now, you know, people, another thing designers say is like, hey man, it's just games, right? It's just, it's just an entertaining pastime. Don't get so serious about it. But I have to take this very seriously because quantity matters and video games are becoming very, very popular, right? Um, you know, going back to drinks, if you drink some alcohol once in a while, it's cool, you know, it's totally fine. It's a nice beverage that gets you a little tipsy. If you get stinking drunk like four or five days a week, then you're gonna be seeing that doctor that we talked about earlier because your liver is gonna be dead, right? Um, everybody knows that, right? That's not controversial. Quantity matters in that case, right? Um, in a similar way, if one person wastes a little bit of time, you know, with some stupid game that doesn't do anything for them, that's, that's no big deal, right? But when you have a nation of people who spend a large amount of time on something that's not just a waste of time, but that actively kind of makes them a little dumber, poorer, sheep-like, and infantilized, um, that becomes a much more serious issue. Uh, and as huge and popular video, as video games are right now, they're only going to get more popular, right? I don't see them declining anytime soon. And so I think as game designers, we have a responsibility, and I'm speaking of me and my friends and anyone in the audience who thinks they might be a game designer someday, uh, we have a responsibility proportional to the number of people that we will affect with our products, right? And I want to talk to about something closely related uh, because I feel like people are a little bit deadened to this kind of issue because we face it in simpler and, and more obvious to see ways all the time, like psychological manipulation, right? You go out to buy things and like everything is, is priced in something that ends in 99 cents or 95 cents, right? Why is that? It's because if you sell something for 9.99, you make way more money than if you sell it for $10 because more people will buy it because obviously 9.99 is a lot cheaper than $10, right? Well, no, I mean, obviously it's not. As thinking, intelligent, rational creatures, right? We know this is stupid. This is kind of insulting because I know, I know what $10 is, right? I know what $9.99 is. There's just not really a difference. Um, but despite the fact that we believe that on an intellectual level, uh, this gets to us uh, at a lower level, right? It affects at least enough people um, to make this the only real strategy for selling something, right? But Beyond that, you know, it affects people who, who think that they're immune to it. Like, oh, I'm a smart guy. You know, I don't, advertising doesn't work on me, you know, and, and like everybody thinks that kind of thing, uh, but it's not true, right? So another example from the field of video games, uh, Microsoft points, which you buy things for, uh, with on the Xbox 360, uh, are intentionally, you know, they're engineered so that the conversion ratio between Microsoft points and US dollars is like, is it? 800 to 10 dollars? Yeah, that's what it is. It's something that doesn't evenly divide so that you can't easily do the math in your head about how much something really costs, right? If you're really used to the system, you might know that an 800 point game costs 10 dollars, but 
you know, if something is like 1,200, it, it takes you a little longer to think about how much that is. So you don't really think about it as much, or at least that's the hope, right? This is intentional. 999 is intentional. And the problem is that we walk around every day with these like insults in our face, right? 999 says, I'm gonna manipulate the, I'm gonna manipulate you at the level of human responses that you don't have control over. I'm not gonna treat you as an intelligent human being because I know I'll make more money off you that way, right? That's what these things are. Uh, now, of course, if you want to buy my last game, Braid, you can buy it for $9.99 on Steam or 800 mi Microsoft points. Um, and, uh, you know, I, in, I am at least a counter or a, uh, I'm at least complicit in this, right? I don't exactly have control over setting pricing on any of these channels, but by participating in that, I support it, right? And there's this thing where as a game designer, you just have to pick your battles. You can't fight every fight all the time. Um, so the best I could do with something like Braid is to try and make a wall, right, and insulate it so that outside the game all this kind of horrible stuff happens. And inside the game is kind of a garden where I respect the player and I treat them as an intelligent person who I would like to know and, and talk to. Um, and unfortunately, I wasn't even able to do that because of achievements, but I cut that from the talk. So uh, if you want me to rant about achievements, ask me a question later. Um, but, you know, I wanted to bring this thing up and the fact that I engaged in it uh, to make a very clear point um, that my goal in this talk isn't to convince you, you know, not to treat people like machines or resources and that Farmville's evil because it, because it farms people, because it treats them like resources. That's not exactly it. Uh, because we're biological creatures and certainly, like, all of biology, all of the history of evolution has been about creatures treating other creatures as resources, right? That's what biologists learn when they come to college, if they didn't know it already. Um, you know, when you have some hamburger for dinner, you're treating a cow as a resource. Um, and people dealing with people is uh, often not any different, though hopefully uh, not food-wise. <laughs> I don't know. So, um, you know, my goal, among all this you know, storm of conflicting ideas, is to try to respect the player and avoid manipulating them, right? I, b because manipulation is not a sign of respect. It's like, I'm gonna, you know, not only am I gonna treat you like a resource, but I'm gonna do it in such a way that I don't really care that you're mistreated and I'm gonna profit off it. Um, the problem that I have is that these good game design things that I talked about, the best practices at the beginning of this talk, are all, to one degree or another, in either subtle ways or obvious ways, manipulative tactics. And that's why abstract games like chess or Go don't have them, because there's like nobody there, there's not enough content in those games to actively manipulate you. But video game designers actively manipulate their players all the time. And I have a problem with this because I don't want to manipulate my players, right? But if I'm going to be a competent game designer, right, if I'm going to make games that people want to play that are video games, right, then they probably have to incorporate some of these items. So just like pricing something at $9.99 if I want to like actually have enough money to make my next game, I probably have to use at least some of these practices if I'm going to make a game that enough people want to play that I can make that I'm allowed to make my next game. And so trying to design a good game according to good game design practices today while respecting the player is a very difficult thing to do, that you have to be kind of a contortionist to try to like squeeze through all the gaps. And you know, I kind of think you almost can't completely successfully do it. You know, your contortionist is gonna like at least crush his finger on the way through there. Um, Now, this is enough of a problem, but there's kind of a meta problem, which is I feel like both people who enjoy video games and game designers, but I've been talking about game designers the whole time, so I'll switch now to people who enjoy video games, don't like it when people bring up this kind of suggestion, right, and talk about it, and the reason is because they identify with video games. They really enjoy video games. Never mind that video games were designed so that they would really enjoy them, right? They really enjoy video games. And uh, when you when you suggest that this thing that they so closely identify with may have negative aspects to it, they don't want to think about it, right? It's a self-defense mechanism that's common to all of humanity. It's common to, common to lots of subjects and not just video games, right? Um, but people go into defense mode. Um, what interests me is that, again, going back to the subject of 
interventions in human psychology, right, this kind of defense mode, if you value uh, critical thinking and value understanding the truth, you can learn to recognize it in yourself and learn to circumvent it, right, and be a little more rational about your opinions and about what you think about things like this and try to see things more objectively. Whether you can succeed or not is more difficult. But again, it's a case of circumventing uh, human psychology in order to do something beneficial. Um, so anyway, uh, if you remember that spectrum that I put up before, I'm not going to flip back to it. Um, there's some line on that spectrum. I mean, it, it's a projection into 1D of all these games, so it's inherently going to be messy and a little bit inaccurate. But there's some line that, divide, that divides games that are beneficial from games that are harmful. And it's not really my business to draw that line today. I don't want to try and convince you exactly what's beneficial and what's harmful, because again, that is up to the opinion of every designer and, in fact, the opinion of every player. Um, but what I would like is for people to have an opinion about it, right? When people design a game, to think about what that game is doing, and when people play a game, to think about what that game is doing. And people don't right now. They think about how it has cool graphics and like a lot of levels, and like they love the story about killing the bad guy, which is not a very um, it's not a very self-aware uh, place to be standing uh, when you're consuming something that affects your life for so many hours and, and therefore affects your mind for so many hours. And that bothers me. And that makes me feel bad about being a game designer and programmer who implements game designs. Um, so, but, but what I have to do as somebody who makes games is decide for myself then uh, how do I know what's beneficial and what's malicious so I can make my own personal decision about where on that spectrum I want to land and what games I make. And even that, not trying to prescribe globally, but just locally for myself, even that is a very, very difficult problem. Um, but I can tell you how I try to solve it. Um, the first thing that I do, at least for the past few games, is I always try to be in a mindset where I'm respecting the player, right? Um, I, think that, I think of the player as a very intelligent person or a person with a rich life whose time that I want to make the game worthy of. I don't want to waste their time. I don't want to degrade their quality of life outside or inside the game, right? Um, but while doing those things, keeping in mind that the idea of respecting the player is itself a very tricky and thorny concept full of contradictions, and that would be a whole separate lecture. But I'll just say that if you, if you really think you understand what it means to respect somebody while you're making something for them to consume that you profit from, uh, you probably don't, haven't looked closely enough and don't really understand. Um, but despite the fact that I don't really understand it yet, I'm always trying to understand it more and trying to use that notion of respect to guide my design decisions. Right? And one thing that this results in, uh, which is surprising to many people uh, when I tell them about it, um, actually no. <laughs> I'll save that for the next paragraph. Um, but, but one more natural result of this uh, direct respect for the player is that um, I try to minimize the use of these manipulative tactics um, of what is considered good game design. So this is, again, a paradox. Like, as I'm trying to be a good game designer, I try to minimize the number of traditionally acknowledged good game design tools that I use because they're all manipulative. Um, and when I do use them, which is almost unavoidable, I try to have a very light hand in using them, using them the minimum amount possible. Um, that's not even true. Minimum is not the right word, as you'll see in a moment. Um, but the results of all this, and this is the thing that people get surprised when they hear, is that when I sit down to make a video game, I'm actually not trying to make a game that's the most fun or like the best game, or certainly not the game that'll make the most money, right? Um, which most people think like, oh, that's what a game designer do, does. He's like someone trying to make the most fun game. Um, but I realized, and I would have said, you know, two years ago, I'm trying to make the most interesting game. But I realize now, again, that that's not even exactly true. Um, because I'm not trying to optimize the player's experience anymore. Because in order to optimize, you need to treat the player in this kind of scientific way, where you're using that as, them as an experiment or as an instrument that you're measuring constantly, right? Um, and that leads to disrespect almost automatically. Um, so instead of trying to make the most fun game, there's some other things that you can try to do that are, uh, to my mind, uh, loftier goals, right? Um, you could decide to make uh, an intensely personal game, right? This is a game that, that is about me and what I feel, and hopefully somebody will connect with that, right? You can decide to make 
a game on a subject, like an intellectual subject, that interests me very much right now. It's not really trying to be that emotional, but it's like cool how like the Russian space program did all these things. Um, or uh, I could be making like the game that'll impact players' lives in the way that I want while still making a reasonable amount of money. This is like a more pragmatist view of what kinds of uh, games to make. Um, these are all totally respectable goals, um, or sorry, totally reasonable goals that can be done from a mindset of respecting the player. Um, now I want to come at this in a different way because I think that there's a certain viewpoint that we have in modern Western society that makes it a little hard for us to think about this kind of thing in a totally like open and heartfelt way. Um, and that's science, right? You guys are at a modern university. We're all, uh, we're all members of a Western society that has benefited tremendously from science, right? Um, and what science has shown us through the development of technology and reason and all these things is uh, it shows us the value of being serious about the objective world. I skipped slides. Um, right, science is about measuring empirical things. It's not about your opinion. Um, so, so what you do in science is you kind of take the world apart and you understand how it works and you don't necessarily believe explanations that are given to you by human authority figures or things that would make you comfortable. You do the measurements and then you try to explain the measurements, right? And then you try to figure out what's going to happen in the future and then you test it. Um, and because of all this benefit of science, right, that's why I was able to fly here today to give you guys a talk on a computer. It's probably why some of you are even alive today rather than dying in childbirth, right? Or young, you know, from some disease. Um, but it feels like in the Western world today, because we've gotten so much benefit from science, we've kind of like, uh, are a little bit overdosed on the objective view of the universe. And what I do as a game designer is actually look sort of at a subjective view of the universe and value that, right? And what I'm here just to baldly assert today, because I'm almost at the end of the talk, is that the subjective viewpoint of experience is also valid, just like the objective one, right? It's also true. And, and by subjectivity, again, just like speaking to the human condition, I'm going to leave that a little bit vague and not exactly define it, but it's something like your consciousness as an aware individual human being, right? That has some kind of essence that's worth paying attention to and worth considering important, right? And this is obvious because it's what makes all of us feel like there's a point to being alive at all, right? And it's obvious to game designers who want to make something fun because what's, what's the point of a non-sentient, unaware group of atoms having fun? Like that phrase doesn't make sense to us. Um, unless we get into this really technical mode and then we're not even really thinking about each other as human beings anymore, right? So as a game designer, um, what I do is value the subjective. It's sort of become the area that I like to explore. And I feel like there's a lot of value that the game design community, that the field of games can bring to human understanding of subjective consciousness. It's one thing that games do better than anything else because games are interactive, right? Um, so this game that I made, uh, you know, was an interesting puzzle game, but you don't actually do that much in it. There's not that many objects that you mani manipulate or whatever. The interesting parts of this game, the little discoveries and aha moments that you have, all happen inside the player's head. Also the frustrating parts, but you know, that's part of the game, man. Um, the new game that I'm working on uh, is about epiphany, right? It's about something's right in front of you and you didn't see it and now you see it, right? Or, you didn't understand something, but you failed to understand it not because it was too complicated, but because it was too simple. And now you understand it and everything seems different, right? And that's purely a subjective experience. Um, you can't, you know, I mean, there are people who do, never mind, I won't even go off on that tangent. Um, now, again, I'm not here saying, I'm not here to be a hippie, right, and say that like, oh, science mechanizes people and you should like, I'll have a group hug or something. Um, because both things are true, right? As a game designer, I have to constantly deal with the fact that the people I am making this game for are products of evolution. And if I want to be uh, successful in designing games, I have to manipulate them as a, a little bit as products of evolution because that is what they want me to do. That is what they enjoy, right? At the same time, I have to realize that that leads into a very slippery slope that very quickly uh, leads to treating people like a science experiment or like a resource 
And then you're in a whole different business than what I want to be in, right? Then you're in the Farmville business. Um, to be competent, a competent game designer in terms of skills and a, uh, a respectable game designer from my point of view in terms of what I'm doing in the world, I have to keep both of those, ax both of those sides of that axis in mind at all times. Um, and that's why I, I said I don't try to make the most fun game, right, or the most money or anything, because that's about maximizing, right? Maximizing is about hill climbing. It's about a scientific process. And as soon as we focus all of our attention on the objective aspects of a scientific process, we're focusing our attention away from the subjective stuff that's over here. And it's not, it's not healthy for game design. Um, and so the last thing that players tend to say whenever I get all serious like this is something like this. They say, well, hey, I, you know, I, the, the lecture's over an hour. They get sleepy. They're not really listening anymore. And they're just like, they don't want to believe what I say because it's potentially negative for games. And so they go just like, hey, man, games should just be fun. What's the big deal? I'm having fun with games. And uh, I'm not going to answer that. Uh, well, yes, I am. I'll start answering it by saying uh, fun is a confusing word. Um, it's again a very vague word, um, but we can say something about it to go one step beyond this argument or this assertion, which is just that, you know, earlier in the talk I described, uh, you know, boredom as having an evolutionary purpose and frustration having an evolutionary purpose. Well, fun probably also has an evolutionary purpose, right? And so what is that purpose, right? And is the fun you're having with a particular game fulfilling that purpose or is it not? And if it's not fulfilling that purpose, what does that mean in terms of the fitness function in evolution or whatever you want to think about, right? Um, and the second thing to ask is, uh, you know, you say you're having fun, but is it really fun? Um, I, I used to play a lot of Counter-Strike. I, I used to be ranked in, in Counter-Strike and in a very serious clan and stuff. And I, I really would play that game a whole lot. It was a very interesting game. I'm glad I spent a lot of time playing it. It absolutely was not fun. Uh, very serious, very hardcore game. But most people will report if you ask them if it's a fun game. Oh yeah, Counter Strike's really fun. Um, but look up some synonyms for fun. You know, you find words like joyous or you know, I don't know, things like that. Um, when you're playing one of these hardcore first-person shooters, ask yourself a different synonym of fun. Is this a joyous experience that I'm having? Right? Um, you'll find very quickly that it isn't. And so what what we see is that the word fun is being used as a linguistic catch-all for a number of other different things that are very complicated, right? And so starting to introspect into that, into what exactly is this fun that I'm having, what's the nature of it, and how does it affect my life is sort of the road to understanding these things better. And the rest of the answer to this is what I'm not going to answer. I'm going to let Alan Moore answer it. Um, this is from a, a documentary called The Mindscape of Alan Moore. And he says, writers and people who had command of words were respected and feared as people who manipulated magic. In latter times, I think that artists and writers have allowed themselves to be sold down the river. They have accepted the prevailing belief that art and writing are merely forms of entertainment. They're not seen as transformative forces that can change a human being, that can change society. They're seen as simple entertainment, things which, with which we can fill 20 minutes, half an hour, while we're waiting to die. It is not the job of artists to give the audience what the audience want. If the audience knew what they needed, then they wouldn't be the audience, they would be the artists. It is the job of the artists to give the audience what they need. Thanks for your time, thank you for listening, and I will take questions if anyone wants to stay after. This okay, so we have microphones. If you'd like to ask a question, Make sure you wave your hands vigorously in the air, and we'll get a microphone to you. There's a guy up there waving his hands. Anyway. OK, well, sorry for preempting you, guy up yeah. there. But um, you, you mentioned that you felt compelled to engage in these manipulative practices in order to be successful. And compelled is not the right word, but yeah. It's, it's, something I'd better pay attention to, to be a competent game designer in the modern age. You know, now that we're not making 80s style games anymore. Right. Yeah. And I'm wondering, um, you know, if I view that in terms of art, I can hear similar things from artists I know saying that they have to work to make their art accessible. 
And if you view this in terms of products that you're designing for people, maybe this is affordability and ease of use. And where is the line between making something accessible and affordable and easy to use and making something that is manipulative, which is perhaps similar, but... but no, it, it, is, it is absolutely a little bit similar. Um, but it's something that you kind of have to answer for yourself while you're making something, I think. Um, I'm not going to say to anybody, you know, here's the line where this is manipulative, but this is merely helpful, right? Um, that's part of what having a strong opinion about what you're making is, right? It's, and that's part of where the work comes from when you're doing it. Um, I definitely, when I'm making something, have strong feelings about whether something is too far in that direction. And I absolutely like cut things back. You know, there's sort of a tutorial in Braid, uh, but it's wordless, and you walk in and it just puts icons for the buttons on the screen. And uh, that uh, assumes a certain level of video game literacy, right, if you're playing the game. Um, but I was okay with that, because it's a video game literate kind of game. And I didn't want to handhold people. Um, first of all, because it would spoil the mood. Excessive handholding is not really what the game is about. Um, but also because of that respect thing, because Braid is, was about, uh, you know, so there's two things that are active, right? There's my opinion as a designer, and then there's like what the game is about. And both of those colluded, uh, agreed on the same decision, um, because Braid is about discovering stuff. It's about the game sitting back, and you have to figure it out, and you have to come to the conclusions. It's not going to tell you. So uh, an overbearing tutorial actually would not fit that theme. Um, but I think that even something like an overly, uh, like a lot of Japanese games have tutorials, modern Japanese games, have tutorials that are very, very handholdy, where you have to click through tons and tons of text, and I don't feel respected by those at all. I feel like I, they think I'm six years old, and I would never make that kind of thing. But there's a middle ground that's totally reasonable. So you mentioned earlier that we humans have evolved, and I think the game designers have evolved, as you pointed out, to to adapt to what uh, generates more money. So if you follow this line of thought to the logical conclusion is that, the conclusion is that people like you will be dying species because you would not be making enough money, so people would not be adapting your style. So that concerns me because that means in the future we'll be getting more and more games like Farmville and Mafia. No, Wars. you know, I, I don't actually think that's exactly the conclusion. I mean, I agree to you that that's a, with you that that's a concern. Um, uh, but to, uh, to, to go back to evolution, I, d I don't want to beat the evolution thing into the ground because it's not meant as a precise metaphor here, and you can like, use evolution to explain anything you want, including things that are clearly wrong, right? But, um, you know, in, in ecosystems, things find niches that are quite profitable for them. Uh, you know, they're able to live nice lives and whatever, and they're not dominating the ecosystem, but they don't have to, right? I already don't dominate the ecosystem, right? A game made by Electronic Arts that's very successful will sell uh, probably 20 times what a game that I make will sell. But I don't need to be Electronic Arts because they have this giant, you know, elephant body and I have like a tiny ant body, right? Um, so I think it's okay. It's, it's okay to not try to maximize um, because you don't need everybody to buy your game. You don't need some nebulous like demographic the size of, of the United States or of the world to all like what you make. You only need a small number of people to like what you make very much, enough that they'll go out of their way to hear about it and get it and play it. And uh, that's how it worked for my last game. And I hope that that continues to be viable in the future. Certainly the internet makes that much more viable now than it was any time in the past. Because in the past, distribution was tightly controlled through re retail stores, and it was very hard to get into a retail store. Now that's not true. So if you have people who are interested enough in what you're doing, they can get what you're doing. They can get your thing, your product. Who is first? I have it right here. Yeah. Uh, what you talked about a lot was single player challenge games. I'm right here. Single, yeah. like where you're playing against a machine or people that you don't see. How, how do you, where do you see social games fitting into your perspective or your one dimensional line? Okay, so I don't exactly like the name social game because the, the games that are social, like on Facebook and stuff right now, are not actually very social. Like, you don't interact with people, right? It's a very, it's a very passive thing. So I'm assuming that you mean not I mean, games things that like, have social elements, but that exact genre of game. I'm, right? I'm talking about games like the Wii, Wii-structured games where they're trying to get people together and okay, use... Okay, so like, like same-room multiplayer kind of thing. Yeah. 
Um, and what do I think about that? Well, because they're, they're not necessarily, they're used more as a social tool to get people together and do things. So it seems like it's a different direction than single player challenge games. Sure, it, it definitely is. Um, the, the games that I talked about uh, today, um, a, a lot of them are single player, but I would more say that they, they are, tend to be games with a very heavy design hand. And one reason that there's a lot of single player stuff there is because single player games have a lot of content, because that's what you do is you chew through the content. And something like Wii Sports, you're like playing tennis a bunch of times or whatever, and it's, it's not the same content heavy experience. And so the designers don't necessarily do this big, uh, giant infrastructure of manipulative work in those games. Um, that said, I do, I mean, I find Nintendo's aesthetic for that kind of game kind of schmaltzy, and it is a little bit manipulative and insulting, I think. But not nearly in the same way as like something like, you know, Farmville. Totally, totally different magnitude of, of thing. Um, but a, as for those games, yeah, it's a totally cool direction to go in game design. You know, there's lots of different ways to go, and I certainly can't uh, talk about them all. You know. Um, I have two questions about Braid. Sure. Uh, well, the game starts with a background of a village burning down. So, uh, so what's going on? <laughs> um, I, I think that if you, if you are playing the game and you're standing there and you're watching that opening screen, then you see exactly what's going on in the opening screen. Well, I finished the game. Yeah. Already. So, so you know. Don't spoil it. <laughs> well, and also, well, well, I mean, I'm not even trying to not spoil it. I'm just saying that that's like the reason, OK, the reason that I make video games like I used to when I was early in college, you know, I, I wrote a little bit of science fiction and got some stuff published. It's under a pseudonym, so you can't look it up. Um, did I know you back then when I was writing that stuff? I don't know. You probably didn't see it. I never saw it. Yeah. Um, the reason that I make games is because at some point, I found myself wanting to get at ideas that are pretty grand, and they don't lend themselves very well to linguistic explanations. Um, because language is very serializing, right? And if you want to get at something that's extremely multidimensional and extremely nebulous and yet extremely important to people, um, if you're doing it through this process where you have to unserialize all this language and then somehow rebuild it into this thing, it's a very difficult and error prone process. It doesn't exactly work. Video games, you know, like, like film, for example, is, is different because it gives you this higher bandwidth experience and you can do stuff visually in ways that you can't exactly do in other media. And video games uh, have, uh, you know, because they have interactivity, they allow you to explore a space. And because they allow you to explore the space, they allow you, they, because they allow a player to explore the space, they allow the designer to communicate the shape of that space more implicitly than you can with language because it is found as opposed to told. Um, and that's important. That's part of why the medium is respectable as its own thing, and it's not just like film with interactivity or whatever, right? So um, when I do something like that, that opening scene, which that first level in Braid, if you like load up the level editor and you see like how many objects are there, it's way more complicated than any other level in the game. And it's just to do these certain effects and have the camera pan in a certain way and all this stuff. And it's because we cared a lot about what was happening there. But as far as I'm concerned, the entirety of the communication of what is happening there is contained in the game. And that's all that needs to happen. And that's why I make video games. So that's why I don't want to tell you. Is uh, that, what was is the that, other question? Okay. Oh, OK. Too many questions. Um, Something that's becoming more prevalent with online distribution is downloadable content. Um, do you feel that it's uh, just another way for companies to make more money by offering additional you know, content to, um, to players? Or is it a way for companies who didn't, weren't quite able to get the content um, create it during development, uh, a way to get extra stuff out there for the players to enjoy? Uh, it's not B, and the reason why is because it takes a long time to download and, or, or to develop and debug downloadable content. And studies have shown that the optimum window to release your DLC, uh, there's been a few studies and, and they conflict a little bit, but they all have the same general conclusion, 
which is the optimal time to release your DLC is right when the game releases, because that's when the most people are paying attention to your game. Games are a very hit-driven thing, where it's like movies, where everybody goes wants to go see the new movie, and then they're not interested. Even if it's a good movie, they probably won't watch it if it's like five years old, right? Um, so you kind of have to develop the DLC for the most part uh, while you're developing the game if you want to hit that. And, and, and some studies say, well, there's like a three-month window or something. You know, whatever it is, it's very close to the release of the game. And for games that take years, like a couple of months doesn't matter. Uh, what it is, it's also not necessarily to make money, um, more money from players, because the fact is that the cost of a DLC, like the price of a DLC, times the number of units that you will sell, is a small amount of money compared to the price of the game times the number of units that you'll sell, right? And that's obvious. The game's like 60 bucks, the DLC's like 10 bucks, so divide by five, and then how many people buy the DLC? Well, it's certainly a subset of the people who bought the game. Divide by what, five, 10, 20, right? So you're talking about a small amount of money. Um, now, for big hits, it makes sense, right? For big hits that have a lot of mind share, and especially if they're open world kind of games, you might have a higher percentage of people buying the DLC, right? Um, and for a longer lifespan, and so, and because it's just such a huge revenue number that a small percentage of that is still a large number and you wanna do it. But the real reason, to get to the end of this long-winded explanation, um, is that DLC is about uh, prolonging your interest in the game so that you don't sell it to GameStop as a used game. That's basically the main thing, uh, because game publishers really, they're, they're, they don't make any money when that happens, and they're upset about that, and they're like, how do we get people to not, either not want a used game or not sell their game back as used? And this is one of the many ways that they do that. I need to start giving shorter answers because there are a lot of okay, questions. We'll so I'm gonna go broader instead of deep on these. Yeah, after that I can answer questions like privately and stuff. Or, you know, feel free to walk out and, and all that. Uh, who's, who's up next? Yeah. Um, I was just curious. I uh, watched the video of Soldier Boy uh, playing Braid. I was wondering, um, as someone who tries to involve gamers on a deeper level, uh, how do you deal with people who simply view Braid as a form of entertainment and only look to the eye candy and, I guess, the classic elements of a good game? Sure. Well, you know, there's always going to be those people, um, and you can't control that. So you don't... I mean, if you make something and, and somebody doesn't like it, right, you, you can't really get mad at them. I mean, that might be your instinctual reaction. Or if they don't, if they don't understand, they don't understand my brilliant thing, right? Um, that's just gonna happen. That's just the world. And so uh, you kind of just have to focus in the other way and say this game is for the people who are really gonna find it interesting and enjoy it and like it. And hopefully I find enough of those people. And so you, you just do like a positive negative space thing and you look at the other space because uh, yeah, there's, there's a lot of people out there who won't respect your work or, or pay attention to it or whatever. Okay. Uh, okay. First, really quickly, I thought you uh, might be pleased to know that I came to this talk neither as an ambitious game designer nor as a passionate gamer, but uh, closer to an ex-addict back from when A Link to the Past was the latest Zelda game. Um, but I wanted to know, with the uh, Alan Moore quote right at the end, uh, it kind of brought this conflict that you were talking about um, outside of just gaming into uh, at, at least literature and who knows what else. And I was curious, um, are you familiar with the work of David Foster Wallace at all? I have only read a little bit of his stuff, but I do plan to read more, actually. Okay. Yeah. Because um, I... I uh, no tons about him, like unreasonable amounts, borderline obsessed. But um, he, I was noticing a few parallels uh, with what you were talking about. And as you were uh, developing the lecture, it seemed to get to be an almost eerie parallel, how you guys were exploring a lot of the same conflicts in totally different contexts, um, even where you were kind of a, uh, dissatisfied with exploring grand ideas in language because it's inherently linear. He kind of felt frustrated by the linear nature of novels and how it didn't really reflect the way he felt like he had to construct reality from thousands of discrete uh, data he received every day to the nature of boredom and does it have value and how a lot of postmodern tricks in literature really 
serve to either entertain the reader without doing a whole lot or serve the darker purpose of telling the reader, look how smart an author I am. Um, yeah. And it, a whole ton of other things. Um, yeah, I mean, I'm not surprised. That. I mean, I, certainly because he was a writer, he was trying to do pretty different things. Um, but there is always that, like, I feel like if you're good at the medium you're working in, you see its limitations, right? I see a lot of limitations of game design. Um, and, uh, you know, we're still figuring out what those are, obviously, but um, at least I feel like it's early in the game. Like, games are going to get evolve a lot more, right? So uh, I can't get frustrated with the limitations of game design yet, because maybe we just haven't figured out how to do certain things. So, but yeah, I mean, um, I actually know a guy who was a, a friend of David Foster Wallace's and has told me some stories. And he sounds like a guy I would respect a lot, and that's why I want to read more of his stuff. So, on the part when you mentioned the video game as a form of, uh, as a medium of communication, like, there's this equivalent genre, like, like the whole movie industry. And my question is, like, when the movies like, you know, Avatar or like Inceptions were released, like, pe like just, there's just so many people talking about it, like, just people just, like, have, like, their like, opinions and, like, their, like academy, like some sort of an analysis, this kind of stuff. But when they like, you know, the same, the games with similar capitals like spent, like when they were released, is like they're like barely discussed. I mean, so my my question is like, what do you think about the like the cultural reception or the cultural significance that the video games are holding right now, and what what it can hold in the future? Yeah. I'm going to answer this one not in too much depth, and the reason for that is because people talk about it all the time, not just me. Um, and you can find answers on the internet, but the short answer is that for genres like film and books and music and all that, there are pre-existing examples of, uh, and this isn't the only answer to your question, but this is the one that, that works best for me as a model. There are pre-existing examples of things that were really important books or really important films or films that were really meaningful to people. So you can have... Uh, you can have films that are obviously just entertainment films, which almost every film made, certainly from Hollywood, is just an entertainment film. It's not trying to be deep or important, right? And yet, because you have those examples, the medium of film or the medium of novel still has cultural validity, right? Even though, you know, even the fact that The Da Vinci Code got published and was massively popular doesn't besmirch the potential for novels to be deep and meaningful, right? And people understand that, and that's why people pay attention to that stuff, right? Um, the other part is also, I mean, uh, okay, and, and it's just that video games don't have that yet. Will we ever have it? I don't know. We have to, game designers kind of have to step up their, uh, step up their game, right, and make things that are more meaningful to people before they will get cultural acceptance. Because if the, if the most we can ever do is like, ah, I'm bloodily running around and killing creatures with knives and stuff, if that's our deepest thing, we shouldn't have cultural legitimacy. Like, we just shouldn't. It's not that interesting. So, um, yeah, and then there's also the nerd factor, right? I mean, even regardless of who, who it is, right, you could have the, um, you know, really, you know, great looking, you know, public speaker, uh, I don't know, like, what's, like a, like a, an infomercial kind of guy who, like, ten, I guess those guys don't look that good. One or two of them do. <laughs> like, some guy who's, like, your, your socially stereotypical, like, good looking guy, right? And you sit him down in front of like, uh, you know, Fallout 3 or something, and it becomes a very creepy scene, even though he's like a model. So, like it becomes this thing where he's going into the kind of doesn't have, I don't know what I'm trying to say. It's something about um, how the, the, what it looks like for somebody to play a video game is so uninviting and so a little bit creepy because you disappear into that, that people are icked out by it. And it doesn't, e to some sense, so when I say nerd factor, I don't just mean nerdly guys, which is why I was going for the socially good looking guy. It's that, it's the act of playing video games is a little bit socially hostile most of the time. Now, if we start making games that are less socially hostile, like Wii games and other stuff, that'll change. But as long as we're talking about like 60 hour single player epics, that is also gonna be unappealing to everybody who doesn't play video games, right? So. 
question. Yeah. So um, I think more than almost any other medium, uh, video games kind of suffer from the sequelitis disease. Um, in fact, before I came to this speech, just I checked GameSpot real quick, and the top ten most popular games, uh, eight of them are sequels. Um, and I think there's kind of like this pattern you see where, you know, X developer that's you know has made very few games before will come up with something you know, new, interesting, deep. Um, probably the prime example of the last four or five years or so is probably Bioshock, but then eventually gets picked up and turned into a franchise, in fact. Well, I mean, Bioshock is a sequel, right? It's basically yeah, System Shock Yeah, Bioshock 3, was System Shock 3, but... But they didn't have the trademark or whatever, right? So it's Bioshock. So yeah. that's not even that great. But it is, it did make a creative break with the earlier thing. Yeah, it became its yeah. own thing. Um, I was speaking more from the... I, I, yeah, yeah. Yeah, but anyway, I, I think I even forgot his name, but the, an EA executive was quoted saying, we don't make games, we develop franchises. Sure. And um, I just want to know what you think, like... Is there a position for the blockbuster art game in the industry as it is without it becoming, you know, this evil that we're trying to fight up with, you know, just manipulative? Well, I mean, what do you mean by blockbuster? Like, my game, so, you know, Braid, my last game, um, sold very well. You know, it, it didn't sell as much as an EA game, but it sold so well that I don't, you know, I'm covered for the duration of working on this game. I don't have to um, make money, right? I so, guess what I'm trying to say is, like, a game with the same motivation of, like, you know, uh, conveying a specific, like, thought or idea or being, you know, beneficial to the player as, as opposed to being uh, harmful or manipulative, but still having the backing of a large studio. Um, um, I, you know, I think that... Uh, it, it, you know, predicting the future is a very dicey proposition, right? Mm -hmm. Almost never is it done accurately. But um, my gut instinct is not anytime soon is the answer to that. And if you just look at something like films or like popular books or whatever, the most popular things are generally not the deeper things, right? For something to become respected and, and to widely, be widely spread as a deep thing, as like a great novel, it, it doesn't happen right after it comes out. It's like it kind of gestates for a while, and then people realize, oh, yeah, that was a great novel 50 years ago or 100 years ago or whatever. Um, you know, certainly with film, most films that are made are kind of vacuous. And in fact, Hollywood films that have bi high budgets are very heavily manipulative, right? The, the scoring, the, the way the shots are set up and all that, it's, it's you know, emotion jerking a lot of the time varies by director and, and it varies by the whole cast or uh, crew, really. Um, but uh, because that is the case, right, just because popular things are kind of bad usually doesn't mean that once in a while you can't have a very good thing that everybody likes, right? I'm not going to try and pick an example right now because you can get into arguments over whether that thing is really good, but it happens once in a while. Um, and even when it doesn't happen, the fact that those things exist, <laughs> they're just really good for society, right? I mean, if, you know, if 1% if of, I don't know, like 1% of the people in America is a huge number, right? 0.1% of the people in America play your game, that's, uh, what, 300,000 people. That's huge. That's a lot of people that you can influence. And you don't, you don't need to be mass market to have influence, I guess, and to be meaningful to a very large number of people, right? That's the weird thing about video games right now is even though there's these giant blockbusters with like 200 person teams, an individual person or a team of two or three people can make a game that 600,000 to a million people will buy. That's like a huge fan out. That's a huge multiplier on your ability to affect the world. So I think that focusing on trying to get everybody to buy the game is maybe a little bit of a false prize because the, the small amount of good you can do with a moderate number of people buying your game is tremendous. It's in the modern internet age. Are we, are we done? I think. All right, I, think, I thank you all very much for coming. Thank you, John, for a great talk. Thank you everybody for listening. This program is protected by a copyright 
and may not be redistributed in whole or in part without the express written consent of Rice Digital Media Services.